Yeah, it's much pretty. I'm a double guess. Lawrence also invited me. You also Hello everyone, good evening, uh, welcome to Google Developer Space, super happy to have everyone here. Uh, I think many of you, when you last visited the space was over two years ago. Uh, so thank you so much for coming down after work or even from home to join us for today. Uh, I'm Jia Sing from the Google Developer Space team and uh, I look after our developer and startup communities in the region. And Lawrence, our events manager at DevSpace, is the one uh, running today's show as well. I think many of you may have seen him online. And uh, a couple of our teammates from the developer relations team are here as well. So we have Rachel, uh, our community manager, uh, taking care of the Singapore communities. Uh, do say hi to her. Rachel can give us a wave over there. Uh, yeah, and we also have Ha and Widya. Uh, they are in charge of the Google for Startup Academy program. They actually flew in from Vietnam and Indonesia this week. So uh, yeah, do say hi to them later on during the break. And a couple of housekeeping rules that we have. Uh, firstly, do keep your mask on at all times, uh, except when you are drinking water or uh, yeah, after the event, if you are going to uh, going outside to eat, of course. Uh, yeah, so then uh, the washrooms are at the back, uh, the ladies and the gents, so feel free to use them. Uh, and for the Wi-Fi, you can connect to Google Guest. Um, yeah, and before we begin our presentation, let me briefly introduce to you what Google Developer Space is about. Um, so we are a home for developers and startups from around the region to learn and connect with one another. And uh, yeah, take lots of pictures when you are here today. Uh, we'll be really happy for you to post them and tag us online as well. Um, yeah, and we are also on all these uh, social channels. Uh, if yeah, we have a website where you can keep updated with all our events. Uh, we are really starting to open a space up for more physical events. So tomorrow, we are actually going to have one with AI space. And next Wednesday, we are going to have one with Data Science uh, Singapore. So if you are interested in all these technologies, uh, we welcome you to join us again. And um, in an unlikely event of an emergency, uh, please take note of this slide. I know it's very wordy and it's a bit boring, uh, but yeah, if you hear an announcement saying that uh, we need to evacuate, uh, just follow any of the Google team and we will uh, use the green exit signs and we will uh, proceed to a safe place. So don't worry too much about that. Uh, yeah, and the next slide will be us. Yeah, this is where we will go to, uh, but just follow us and you'll be safe. Okay, and uh, yeah, and without further ado, we would like to pass the time to today's organizing team, uh, Go Singapore team. So take turn, yeah, feel free to take it away. Hello, hi, <clears throat> good evening. I'm Tik Chun. Welcome back, go first. And uh, I have my organizer team, I should introduce them as well. This is uh, Stanley, I give away Stanley, yeah. And also Abel, who is there, you think, yeah. Okay, feel free to talk to us later in the break. Um, yes, welcome back. And um, so this is a small quiz, right? The last time we were here, uh, anyone knows when was the last time we were here? And it was the Gopher 10th anniversary meetup. Yeah, 10th birthday. Make a guess? It's uh, November 2019. Yeah, so after that, the... Uh, we know all we all know what happened, COVID hit, right? And then we have online meetups and stuff. So we are very happy to be back again. And thanks to Google Desk Spaces and team. Uh, we have these things again. And I also got to know today this is the first physical meetup of Google Desk Spaces as well. So I'm very honored yeah, to have a partner with them also. Yeah. And this is the agenda for today. I'll not take too much of your time uh, introducing uh, the team. Uh, the first speaker is uh Bob Woon. He will talk about uh, replacing our testing framework with just two functions. Right? I don't know what is this. It's very mysterious based on the topic title. Uh, very keen to hear what he has to share. And we'll take a five minutes break. Uh, we switch the slides around, have a bio break. 
And then we have Sao Xiong, who will take us through a quick introduction to generics in Go, right? Which is a new feature in version 18, right? I'm not sure if anyone of you all have tried it, but Sao Xiong will do a quick introduction to it, right? All right, without further ado, uh, we have Bob Woon on the stage and give us a few seconds while we switch over to his slides. All right, and over to you, Bob Woon. Okay. Uh, hi, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, this is uh, my talk for tonight, replacing your testing framework with two functions, courtesy of this very uh, useful package called GoComp. Uh, if, if you know what the package does, you kind of know where this talk is going already. At. Okay, so uh, introduction about myself. I am a programmer at Techwa, uh, mostly Java-related enterprise -y stuff, so not really related to Go. Um, my experience with Go comes primarily from side projects, and in my most recent side project, I came across this, or I started using this testing method, and I really liked it, so I thought I would share it with y'all. Yep. Okay, so introduction. Um, the Go's te testing philosophy is it's just Go code, and this paragraph is from this uh, Go programming language book, and you can see that uh, people are surprised when they initially learn how minimalist Go's testing framework is. So they're used to, you know, X unit, st uh, X unit style tests where you have set up, tear down, before test, after test, and then you uh, utility functions for comparing values as well as aborting a test with exceptions. So uh, although the tests are very concise, written in this way are very concise, but they seem to be written in almost like a, a domain specific language, uh, a foreign language. So in Go, tests are just ordinary Go code. So uh, this is example is for maybe testing math.apps, right? You pass in negative one, you get, oh, is it one? If it's not one, then you call t.rf, and then you write the function name, and then what you expected and what you actually got. And or maybe if you want to abort the test immediately, you call t.fatalf instead. So that's your entry point to tests. It's just rf and fatalf. Uh, but this doesn't really work if you have a very big struct. So you can see here, uh, let's say you want to do this all in the standard library. You have a reflect.d equal because you don't want to compare struct fields one by one. So you do, if it's not equal, then after you print it using, you know, the standard libraries uh, percentage plus V. So that prints structs with the field names and you have a huge chunk like this. So uh, in the red circle, uh, the first red circle is the God, and then the second red circle is the one, and you can see that in the middle is like just a sea of text. You can't see really what's the difference. So people reach for assertion libraries like Stretcher testifies, and you've got this very nice concise language where you've got assert.equal, you pass into testing.t, and then you have the God and one, and you get a very nice diff out of that. So you can see here, expected, what you expected, what the actual stuff that you got. Yeah. Uh, but at the cost of a huge API complexity. So just uh, testify alone, um, it, has, it actually has two packages. It has assert and require, and they are mirror images of each other where assert would uh, mark your test as failed, but not fail immediately, whereas require will fail the test immediately. And each of them have like one for one functions, just like that. Some of these functions seem very suspect, like you've got to assert the file exists, some file.txt. So why not just use, you know, go open the file, then check if the error was OS or error not exist, and then close the file after that. Yeah. So testify isn't the only assertion library out there. There's actually this uh, more lightweight alternative by uh, Matt Ryer. This package is called is. And uh, this uh, second bullet point here tells you everything you need to know about it. Okay, so you've got just four functions in the entire thing. You've got is equal is true, is no error, and is fail. So uh, yeah, it, it's self-explanatory, and that's pretty much what you need, actually, most of the time. And this is, uh, the failures are very easy to read. It does this very cool thing where if you put a comment after your assertion, like this, uh, these four is equal, is true, is no error, um, it will actually go into your source code and then pull out the comment. Like it will, it will do some kind of a reflection or th something, then pull it out, highlight the comment for you, nicely to see. Right, very, very readable. 
but comparing large structs is still sucks, all right? So it only prints values with Sprint F. It's not a pretty printer. And is.eco is arguably the only the only one doing the real heavy lifting because it's true is just, you know, if condition. Is is no error, it's just if error not equals nil. And if fail, is fail, is just t.fail dot fail or t.fail dot fail now. So um, what did I settle on? Um, now my testing framework is just two functions in a single file inside an internal package called testutil.go. So package testutil. Um, the first, I, I don't know if how, yeah, I mean, okay. So the first function is diff, right? It's, it's basically checking if two things are equal and it will return a human readable diff string showing exactly what, it's, it's basically what testify does. Okay, so um, you have a bunch of stuff, but the most important stuff is the diff over here. Uh, that's the, the main heavy lifting because I'm calling this uh, go com function com.diff and I get diff back. And if the diff is not empty, then I will return, I'll annotate this got and one because I, I need to know that uh, the first, the, the stuff with the minus in front is uh, what I got and the stuff with the plus in front is what I want. And colors is, it'll just print a stack trace of whatever colors was invoked. So if you, um, yeah, basically you can call, you can put colors wherever you want and it will show you the, exactly how we caught the colors call from the top level testing function. So it looks something like this, diff, test util, and then after that, I, I got the diff. Then if the diff is not an empty string, then I just t.error, test util.color, so that, that will show the stack trace, and then the diff. And then you get this, uh, it's basically testify, right? You've got the got and want up there, so you can see uh, what I, I wanted was this, uh, this, this uh, description you can see there. It's actually a long string, but it actually can figure out like what ex how exactly the two strings differ. So it's telling me that, okay, uh, I got a string that is lacking this fast pace there because it's a plus in front. So I actually want fast pace, but it's not there. And then it's also showing a slice. It can show the individual slice elements what differ. So the first two items there, I wanted those, but they're not there. Whereas the next two items are Lucille D and Susan Davis. They're actually there, but they're not supposed to be there. Yeah. So um, pros is, it's very lightweight. Everywhere where I need the package, I just copy and paste it where I need it. So I don't import a third party assertion library. Um, those two functions really just do all the heavy lifting. Um, a little copying is better than a little dependency. So I can customize those functions to project specific needs. Um, the diff function actually takes in a bunch of options here where you can do a lot more cool stuff. Like for example, some you, you can actually compare uh, floats, floats float values, yeah. So sometimes you want to compare floats and they don't, you, you know floats are not exactly accurate, right? Sometimes as long as they're within a delta of each other, you want to consider them as equal. So this is what you can, you can pass in an option that lets you like determine the delta uh, between the floats. And then if there's, if it's under that, it's considered equal. So you can comp you can do that if you want, but I'm not doing it here because I never really had to compare floats before. And uh, oh, and you can use generics. So other mainstream packages like Testify or GoCom, they actually haven't switched to generics yet, although I believe they, uh, they want to switch to it. So you can see here, uh, yeah, diff, it, it, it takes in the, a generic argument where they must be the same argument uh, basically. So if they're not, then call at compile time, you, you can't compare a pointer with a struct uh, basically. So uh, why not just call com.diff directly? Um, this is where I feel like the authors of com.div kind of uh, made it a little bit hard to use it direct, uh, directly because it panics whenever you have an unexported field. And if you're writing any kind of library package, you will most likely have unexported fields in your type because you don't want to export them. You don't want to export everything. So uh, you're, you're expected to do this thing where you call comp allow unexported and then you pass in the list of everything that you want to compare, uh, that you want to allow the unexported fields in. And it's gonna be like really complicated if you have nested types within your types and then you have to remember to pass in everything otherwise it's gonna panic somewhere down the line. So too much typing. Uh, I, I default to the, the default where I use this com.exporter. It takes in a function and then it checks whether the type can be, uh, whether it allows unexported and I always return true. So everything is, uh, this is basically the same ref, uh, behavior as ref deep equals, all right? It just compares everything unexported. If you need to change it, of course you can change it. Like if you need a specific thing that you want to, 
here. Yep. Okay, so oh, and the another thing is this comes the equate empty, which is very really useful. It compares nil slices and empty slices as the same, nil maps and empty maps as the same. So I know that this has tripped me up a lot of times. Uh, I only re uh, recently discovered this option actually. I was actually manually instantiating all my nil maps into uh, empty maps so that my test won't fail. But actually I can just pass this in and then they are compared, uh, treated as the same. And of course, I also need to mark it as got and one because if actually doesn't uh, enforce any sort of opinion on you, what is on the left and what is on the right doesn't actually matter. They say like it's just X and Y. I think the, the variables are just X and Y. So you don't actually know which is God and which is one. So you gotta put uh annotate it there so that you know what it is. Uh-huh. Okay, so uh what's the use of colors? Uh it started from this tweet where I saw. Um unpopular go like opinion, right? It's not important to have expressive test failure messages. Like it's just like, you just need to know where the failure happened and then you got to dive into the source anyway. You got to figure out what's, so if you spend so much time making like a very descriptive error message, then you're still often time wasted. Uh, but line numbers are great, but they get messed up by assertion helper functions. So if you use a custom assert helper function, T dot error only reports the line where error was called, not where the assertion function was called. Okay, so you can move it up the stack so you can show where the assertion function was called, but then now you lose the line where T dot error was actually called. So if your assertion function calls T dot error multiple times, you don't know which error was the one that actually returned the error. So basically this thing here, where you can either decide whether you want the errors and here, here or here, or you can show the errors here, here or here, but you're not both, right? I mean, the that's a, that's a choice that they decided to make. So what Colors does is it prints the entire trace from the top level test function where it was called all the way down to where Colors was called. So if you have something like test helper, it calls test helper one and test helper one calls test helper two, and test helper two, I mean, don't do this, but yeah, test helper three calls this and then it finally got test util the errors got here. Okay, so that's where you get, you get 33, uh, like 33, 34, 35, 36, and then finally got here. So that's a, uh, um, it, it allows me to no longer think, have to, you know, think of a meaningful error message for every single test comparison I write because I write a lot of test comparisons. So I can just infer it by looking at where the line occurred in the source file. So instead of now, instead of like, if there's an error, I don't say, oh, this function return an error followed by the error itself. Or I don't say uh, this function, the results are not the same or something. And then followed by the diff, I just directly call test util the callers error test you do the colors diff and then I can just look at the where in the source file it is and then oh okay I get all the context that I need. Um, so yeah um, diff and you diff and colors have replaced my need for a third party assertion library. Um, that's just a go playground. Uh, yeah. Um, then go comp has zero dependencies and it's almost as good as standard library. It's actually maintained by the go team themselves and there's an active proposal to add go comp to the standard library as testing.com. Although currently, uh, I have to admit, the API is actually quite complicated. Uh, there's some people don't really like how complicated it is. They say they, it needs to be a bit simplified before it can be accepted into a standard library. Oh, it doesn't replace mocking libraries like testify mock or golang mock, but I haven't really found myself needing to auto-generate mocks. If I need to have some kind of test double, I'll manually write a struct that implements the interface, so like handwritten mocks. Um, yeah, and the end. Thank you, Braun. Any questions on the floor? Anyone? I'll pass the mic to you. No, no worry. Come over. Uh, oh, the slides? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. You're asking where, where can we get the slides later? Yeah. Oh, I mean, yes. how, how, is it, how should it be shared? I mean, it's... Uh... Uh, we'll take care of it. Yeah, we'll take care oh, of okay. you. Yeah. We'll broadcast to the, to the community. Yeah. Hmm. Any questions from anyone? Good. There's also no online question, I think. Yeah. Okay. No worry, but we're still around. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think you're staying around yeah. till the end. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Any questions? We can still catch them mm. uh, at the break at the counter anywhere. Right. Uh, thank you, Bowen, for sharing this. Right. Thank you very much. So let's uh, 
take a five minutes break. Whoever wants to take a bio break and we'll come back with the second talk. All right, thank you. Trying to gather people to go for go for con Europe together. Is it? Oh, when? Uh? Yeah. <laughs> end of July. End of July. Yeah, yeah. You must tell me when. Eh? Because I need to apply. <laughs> I give you a mic. So, guys, we can start. Very well. I said, so that we can see now, first of all, then he can do some. Okay, okay. All right. I think uh, most of us are still here. So, uh, Let's start uh, the second session. But before that, we want to announce something and uh, pass the, the stage to Valentine, who is also a very active member of the community and uh, organizer of uh, GopherCon right? Singapore. Right? Hi. Um, so my name is Valentine. I organize the Singapore com the GopherCon Singapore. But anyway, it's just this is just an open invite. I'm probably going to the Europe conference in the end of July. So if you want to have like a... We're trying to get a Singapore delegation together to go together in case you want you want to have an excuse to travel, you know. And hopefully, if we get enough people, we might maybe get a group discount or something. Uh. So if anyone's interested, it's in Berlin in July. I think it's a hybrid event. So they actually have online tickets, which are a bit cheaper. But if you are looking for an excuse to travel, this might be a good event to go to. Uh. So just let me know after the after the talks uh, if you are interested or you know, just write into the meetup group. Lah. They can forward the stuff to me. Okay, thanks. Oh yeah, uh, we're going to organize uh, the Singapore conference in the end of the year, probably in November. So, you know, just keep those dates free as well. We'll probably announce, like make a more formal announcement next month or something. All right. Thank you, Valentine. All right. So it's an uh, open invite to uh, accompany him. Huh? Right. I think he feels a bit bored traveling alone. Right. Uh, okay. Now we have our second speaker, Sao Xiong, right? Uh, we'll talk about generics. So yeah, over to you, Sao Xiong. Hello, everyone. I'm here alone, so I will take off my mask. Um, so I'm, I'm going to talk about uh, generics today. Uh, Pardon me if I'm uh, a bit stuttering because I haven't spoken in front of uh, a, an audience for a while. Uh, it's been a while. I've seen a lot of uh, people sitting together and listening to a talk. If tears come down my eyes, like, uh, don't be startled. You know. It's a joke. It's a joke. You know. I'm not going to cry. You know. Okay, so um, a quick introduction to, to generics. Um, uh, let me... Start here. So, so first, don't don't panic. Uh, you've, it's the first time you heard about generics, and you say, "Hey, you know what? Is is Google going to introduce a a very complicated 
uh, a concept and uh, I don't know how to use it and then so on. Um, it's actually not that difficult a concept and uh, the Go implementation is relatively easy to, to understand. Yeah. In fact, um, I think I, I just took a couple of days to... to I, I'm not boasting or anything. Like, it is really that pretty easy. to a couple of days to just uh, really understand it. And I'll, I'll run through what it is and then you'll see what I mean. Okay, so I'll start off with uh, first talking about what generics is, and um, and it's a little bit it's a little bit lengthy, but um, I'll try to talk it through. So so sometimes we have uh, uh, data structures or algorithms, and um, we use these data and structures and algorithms uh, on different data types, right? So uh, you can use it on an int, or you can use it on a float, or you can use it on on anything else, um, but it's the same algorithm or it's the same data structure or it's the same function, right? So uh, an example is, for example, you want to do a, a sort, you don't necessarily just sort uh, an int, but you could also want to sort a float, sort a string, and so on and so forth. And um, in Go, and uh, if you want to implement an algorithm, you do need to specify the data type you want to use. So you can't run away from that uh, uh, because Go is a... Uh, statically typed programming language, right? Like many uh, statically typed programming language, you do need to specify the, the type that you want to use. Um, generic Zen is a, is a feature in a programming language that allows you to write code for a, a generic data type. Okay, so what it means is you don't really need to uh, specify the uh, data type, right? So so that's it, really. That's, that's what generics is, okay? So you don't need to use a uh, specific data type for your code, and uh, you're free to, to basically write code to, uh, to do the stuff that you want to do uh, without having to worry about the specifics of the data type. So that's what generic programming is. It's, uh, not, uh, it's not unique. It's actually available in a, uh, many programming languages. Of course, it's not really so applicable for uh, dynamic programming language, right? Because dynamic programming, you don't care about the data type. So it's really more for uh, statically typed programming languages. Okay, so conceptually, it is quite easy. Um, so let, let me try to just get a little bit in depth on this. Um, the example on the right here, if in Go, if you want to add two ins together, we're using a function. What you would do is uh, you, you do something like that. Uh, your logic, which is uh, A plus B, remains the same in two, two functions, but Actually, you need to literally write two functions and you need to put in uh, int or float 64, right? Or, or whichever data type they're using because, um, because there's no generics previously in, uh, in Go. Yeah. So what generics allow you to do is to just write one single function to, to do both. Okay, so generics is the term that's been used in, uh, in Go. Um, it's also the term that's been used in Java. In fact, I think Java popularized the, uh, the term generics uh, in, in some other languages as well. But if you use some other programming languages, you will find the, uh, the same concept, but it's called differently, right? The Scala, Julia, Haskell, they call it parametric polymorphism. Uh, those who still use C++, uh, uh, it's uh, templates. And uh, if you have read this uh, book by the Gang of Four, they call it the parametric types. But the concepts are the same. Um, they might talk about some differences, minor differences, but generally, this is what it is. Basically, you write code without having to think about the data type that you use. Okay, You can uh, actually use the same code on different data types. That's what generics is. Now, um, Go didn't have generics for a long time, uh, since its inception, in fact. And... Um, and a lot has been written about it, and uh, uh, basically this is what the, uh, the Go team actually wrote about. Russ Cox is one of the, uh, the leaders in the Go team. He wrote that uh, this, right? He said, the generic dilemma is this. Do you want slow programmers, slow compilers, and bloated binaries, or slow execution times? It's quite controversial, right? A lot of people got really turned off by this. Yeah, he's, he's actually kind of a, a very blunt person. Um, and then, of course, in the Go FAQs, it's a little bit more toned down. But generally, what it's trying to say is that um, when they design the, um, the programming language, 
they they knew about this, but they deliberately left it out because uh, they didn't think that it was that important. Okay. But a lot of Go developers thought otherwise. Okay. Uh, just in the and and this is an annual Go developer survey that's been done for many many years. Um, in 2020, among the 26 percent of the respondents who said Go lacks language features they need, 88 percent of them said that they, they wanted generics as a feature. Okay, that's like a lot. If you look at the next feature they wanted is better error handling, right? So uh, coincidentally, these are the two topics we talk about today. So um, anyway, so generics was something that a lot of people wanted. And uh, so, so there were proposals along the way and uh, there were a lot of design proposals It came up uh, it got debated hotly on, and uh, some of it they were thrown away, some of it the features were collected. And eventually there was a uh, proposal that came out on the 13th of January 2021. That's just last year. Um, and it uses a, a mechanism called type parameters. Okay, so I took a snippet out of this. This is was uh, the uh, uh, this was the uh, uh, issues that was added into the GitHub to uh, proposed using type parameters for generic programming. Okay, it was uh, uh, proposed by these two gentlemen. Uh, one is Ian Lance Taylor. The other one is uh, Rob Grissimer. And of course, there was uh, hotly debated about. Um, when you look through this particular issue, they had four hundred over uh, comments. Right, there was like a lot of debates about it. Some of it like quite fiercely debated, but at the end of the day, um, it was accepted. Uh, by Russ Cox, okay, who said that, uh, you know, whatever he said earlier on. So um, it was accepted on the February uh, 11th, 2021. That's one year ago. And just how long is it? Just two months ago, right? 15 March 2022, when Go 1.11 was released, it included this particular implementation for generics called type parameters. Okay, so, so that's a little bit of history of how generics came about. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the, uh, the implementation itself. Okay. So um, the generics in Go uh, 1.18, it's uh, implemented using a mechanism called type parameters. So what it does, uh, what, what it is, is that uh, functions now have something called uh, type parameters. So you have your normal parameters, which are in uh, uh, the round brackets. And then you have this thing called type parameters, which are in the square brackets. Um, and each type parameter have something called a type constraint. Um, the type constraints are actually interfaces. And, uh, and then they also added one new thing called um, any. So any, the A and Y, is a type constraint. But it is also an alias for interface, at uh, the empty interface. You know, if you you use interfaces before, you, you remember there's an interface that has nothing in it. It's just like two uh, uh, curly brackets. Um, this is called the empty interface. So instead of writing the empty interface, they, uh, the new Go 1.18 now has a keyword called any that represents the empty interface. Okay, So these are the main features. Because if you read the proposal, it's actually a... Uh, um, and uh, the proposal is uh, here. You read the proposal, it's... Uh, Pretty long document, but um, generally speaking, these are the features that are in uh, generics. Okay, so what I talked about earlier on, this this is what it is. I, I don't have it, but uh, so this is a square bracket. Okay, um, this is a little bit off. I don't know why, but the, this T here is basically the type parameter. Uh, this N here is the uh, type constraint. Okay, um, it is any here, but then it could be int, it could be float, uh, it could be a union of int and float, and, and so on and so forth. The constraint basically says what kind of uh, types this parameter could be. Okay? So, uh, a bit more wordy, type constraints allow only specific operations on the type parameter, and this is uh, implemented using an interface. So, constraints are actually interfaces. And any is a special keyword that's an alias for the empty interface. Okay, um, you could actually create an interface with a uh, primitive type like uh, int, but you could also union them. 
right, using the uh, the uh, vertical bar operator uh, to create union of types, which means that it can represent any of these ones. And then you have this little squiggly uh, tilde. This means that any customized types that are based on these primitives are also uh, part of the constraints. Okay, so this basically defines the type constraint. This is not that difficult. You have uh, type parameters, and then you have type constraints. And constraints basically constrain the, the parameters. That's, that's about it. Okay, so at the end of the day, what can we do? So if you look at the uh, earlier two, um, two, two functions I wrote, you have the add int and add float. Instead of the add int and add float, now you have just one function called add. And in, in this add, you have a T, which is a type parameter, and then it allows int and float, where you union uh, both of them. And in the, uh, the normal parameters, now A and B are now of type T. Right? Previously, we saw A and B, they are type int or type float64. Now they are of type T. Okay? And your code is just return A plus B, right? as before. No change. Instead of two functions, now you just need one function. If you look at it the, uh, from a top level view, this essentially is what generics 1.18 in Go. Right? Sorry, generics in Go 1.18, right? implemented using type parameters. Not difficult. Okay, um, an additional thing that, uh, so this is, this is additional. Um, Go also provided a constraints package. It is not part of the standard library, um, it's part of the experimental library, right? So you have a uh, uh, golang.org slash x slash exp. Uh, that's the uh, the package name. And uh, this package provides you a number of constraints you can just use out of the box. Um, actually, you don't need them at all, right? Because it's just like uh, the shortcut way instead of writing int, you, uh, you union an int and a float and, and so on, right? They just provide a, a number. Right? But, but the one that is, is kind of interesting is something called an ordered constraint. Um, that defines all the types that support uh, these operators, the uh, uh, greater than, less than, equals to, and not equals to operators. Okay, so if I look at the same code again, as I did just now, instead of uh, uh, int and uh, instead of int and float, what did I do is I define one constraint called number. Now t is of, uh, uh, the constraint is number, so the, the Type parameter T is constrained by a number, and then same similarly A and B is of type T. Okay, so so this is using the constraints package. Okay, so that's a very very general way of using constraints, but this actually impacts uh, the the I would say uh, the standard um, existing data structures in in Go. So Go has. Uh, four default data structures, okay? Arrays, slices, uh, maps, and struts, right? So array and slices are basically almost the same thing, right? Array is, is uh, a slice is basically an overlay on top of uh, a, a array. Um, so we just talk about array, okay? Um, a map is a mapping between a key and a value, and a strut is basically customized data so You can create any data uh, structure that you want using that. So I'm going to talk about how generics influences struts and slices. Okay, but before I do that, um, I wanted to show this, uh, uh, show how this influences using a, a data structure. Okay, um, a strut, and this data structure is the the very uh, it's one of the most popular ones. It's called a stack, right? And within the stack, you have uh, uh, two methods. Basically, it's uh, push and you have pop. Okay. You get peak and then you have is empty. It's just like extra stuff. Essentially, you just look at push and pop here. Now, if I use it the way pre 1.18, you need to define um, what is the data structure. Oh, sorry, what is the data type? Here is a string. So you can only push string in and you can only pop, you will only return the string, right? If you now need to add in a, an int, you have to create an int stack. You want to do a float. You need to create a float stack, right? If you want to have uh, your own specialized struct, struct, uh, and, and you will push into a stack, then you have to create that specialized struct. Right? So that was before 1.18. Now with generics, 
Um, okay, so this is a very quick example of uh, how I do a quick test of, of this. Uh, it passes. Um, I prepared this in case I could actually run this. And it turned out to be true. I can actually run this code. Um, so now if I use this using generics, using type parameters and constraints, let's say I use the constraint called the uh, constraints.order. Okay. So look at the, the differences here. You have uh, a T stack. So T stack is the, uh, the stack that I've just created. But now I need to put into the uh, square brackets the uh, type. Right. And uh, when I define the strut, I need to uh, specify the type parameter and the constraint. Um, in the receiver itself, you also need to put in the uh, type uh, parameter. Okay. And then now you can use this. Now, this is the definition of the strut, but let's see how you can use it. Um, let's use it the same way, right? This is exactly the same way I use it for string earlier on, the uh, string stack. Okay, stack dot push, you push, 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 then you peek, you pop and do a check. Everything runs okay. I do the same thing, exactly the same thing. You still push, 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 peek, pop, pop, and uh, everything runs okay. What's the difference here? The difference, if you look at the T stack, I need to specify what is the type here. You see the blue arrow right at the top. Uh, I can't point to it. It's a bit too far away for me to point to. Uh, it's string, right? So you can put in all the string. Now I need it in an int. What do I do? So I specify as an int. Okay. Then I push, 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 peak, pop, pop. Right. So and now I can push int and I can uh, pop int. Okay. If I change that to a float, it will be the same, and so on and so forth. Okay. So this is how I do it uh, with strut and with uh, slices. Now there's one. One thing that I, I wanted to mention here is quite interesting, um, which is any. So if you use any as a replacement and say here you, you push any uh, and then you pop any, right? So you take a look here. Um, I push three strings and I push an int. So basically now the stack can have both string and int. It's kind of weird. Uh, and if you are developing Go for a while, it seems like, wow, you know, this, this totally blows my mind. It's not, I'm not sure whether I'm very comfortable with this kind of code, but yeah, this is possible if you use any, okay? You can't do this if you were using the type parameters and constraint, by the way. Huh? So if you were using it like this, you now cannot push uh, an int and then a string afterwards because you already specified that you only want int, okay? You can only do it when you send any. Right, so that was uh, struts and slices. Let's talk about the maps here. Um, again, I would use another data structure to, to explain this. I will use the, the set, okay? For just, just to explain what a set is, uh, set the, the base here. Um, a set is basically a, a container of uh, unique items. Like every item must be unique. You cannot have a duplicate uh, item. Okay, uh, that's number one. Number two is that it's uh, it's unordered. So the order that you put it in is not necessarily the order you get it. And every time it could be different or it could be the same. Okay, so that's uh, a set. Now the best way to implement a set for, for, for my perspective, or the easiest way, right? There are many ways of doing it. I think it's just using the keys for a map because the keys for the map are unordered and they must be unique. Okay, and uh, that's the example that I'm using here. Um, again, I have a string, so I, I ignore the val value altogether. It doesn't really matter the value because I'm only interested in the, uh, the, the key. Uh, so uh, items map uh, string, so these are all strings. And um, when I uh, add, is I add a string, I just put a, a int value. I'll never use it anyway, okay? So that's the uh, set data structure. Very quickly, this is how I use it. I add string, okay, and I check. Uh, it looks a bit complicated, but basically because it's unordered, I need to um, I need to sort it first and then uh, before I compare it. But that's that's basically it, right. So that's uh, testing the the set. Um, 
now this is using this is using generics. If you look here, we have this new thing called comparable. So comparable is a constraint. Um, in the new generics, there are two keyword constraints. First is any, which is alias for interface. The second is uh, comparable. Okay, comparable is a constraint that uh, which types that support equals and not equals to. Okay, so it's uh, comparable. And if you are putting generics in a map, you need to make the key comparable. That's the number one requirement. Okay, the value you can put anything in string, flow, or whatever you want. Okay, once you put comparable, you can even put struts, by the way. So uh, uh, your customized strut can be a comparable. Now, I, I put it this way again, if you see the receiver here, the receiver here, the receiver here, you need to put in the key value. Okay, that's, that's important. Um, now I, I add the string, and uh, this, this is the same test code I, I ran earlier on, except the way I created the, the set is different. It runs, and I test it again with int, and it runs as well. Okay, so, so this is how it works with uh, maps. Right, so I I just very briefly described how you would do this with uh, uh, generically uh, how generics work, and then uh, with struts and with slices, and then finally with maps. I hope this has been useful. Um, the code, if you are interested, is in the third line here. is in the GitHub repository, and the first is my uh, is my blog where. I basically write a, a lot of uh, Go stuff. If you're interested, please take a look. In fact, uh, I wrote this deck and then after that, I, I uh, sort of made it into a blog post as well. So you can check it out if you, uh, if you wanted to have a readable version of the, uh, the slide. Okay, so that's my talk today. Thank you. Thank you, Sao Xiong. Any questions for Sao Xiong? No? Okay, that's one. Hold on. Uh, hi, thanks for the presentation. Uh, my question not about the topic. Do you already use uh, generics in SP services? Ah, uh, okay. Um, it's too new. <laughs> yeah, we have not started using it yet. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> Because I'm just curious, how much time will it take for big organization to switch to? Yeah, um, it's uh, released just two months ago, so uh, it is definitely not uh, it's not mainstream yet. Mm. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Sorry. <laughs> I think probably yes, eventually, because it has become mainstream, right? So. Uh, could you go back to that um, slide where you first showed that you could put a string and in, end in one structure? Oh, uh, no. Um, yeah, that test is fine. Okay, this one is? Oh, okay. um, no. This where one? you have string and then you add an end at the... Oh, the, the one for any. Yeah, right? where it's mixed. Yeah. Right, so... When you use the the pop function, right, and you get the item back, what kind of of uh, what data type do you have? It is uh, in the mixed one, right? Where yeah, you have... it's mixed. You yeah. you either get an, uh, I mean, any. In this case, you get like you push in an int, you get an int. Uh huh. Yeah, you push in a string, you get a string. Even in the mixed one. So you don't have yeah. to go afterwards. Like you get usually, you get back an interface or something. Then you have to no. figure out. Or what's inside, right? Yeah, I mean, um, okay. Let me put it a different way. Uh, you you get an int, but um, you need to to uh, you need to type assert it to whichever uh, one it is. Yeah, mm. because any is basically an alias for uh, the empty interface, right? So, in fact, uh, if I don't use any here, if I use uh, uh, the empty interface, it will work exactly the same way. Yeah. Mm. So you have to use kind of uh, reflection and then see, um, is this 100 that I get back, is that a string or is that an name? Yeah, 
Yeah. Okay. Uh, or then after that, you need to time assert it to, to whichever no thing that you want. Thank you. Yeah, hold on. Yeah, hello. Uh, firstly, thanks for the talk. Uh, my question is, earlier on you mentioned something about uh, there will be there might be a performance issue with generics. Is it is there such a thing uh, after it's been released? Um, so if if I could run my code, I will show you the benchmarks. I, 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 I'm not able to do it today. There's actually no, literally no difference. Ah, okay. Yeah, I, I ran the benchmarks. So I was actually quite surprised. I thought there would be a difference. Actually, there's no difference. Maybe maybe the code is too simple. I don't know. But I, I tried to put more stuff in it. And uh, and the performance is the same. Right? Uh, I have not dwelt into it like very, very extensively. Maybe one of these days, it might come out to be different. But so far, uh, I tried it. The, uh, the performance is it's the same. You know? It's actually exactly the same, which makes me wonder a little bit. But uh, you know, I tried it multiple times. It's, it's exactly the same. All right, thanks, thanks. Thank you. Any other questions? All right, hold on. Hi, uh, I'm just curious. The any keyword is just an alias, right? So I can use it regardless of whether I'm using generics or not. Yeah, so you, 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 very, very interesting question. I, and I'm actually wondering that as well, because I don't know, right? And I experimented and tried it out. Uh, you don't see any stuff that's here that's generic at all. Correct. The only thing is the any keyword. So that probably answers your question. Yeah. So what do you mean is I can stop writing map string interface? Please? Uh, I mean, you could. Oh, great. Right. Um, that's why that's why it's, um, I'm also a little bit weirded out because you're like, hey, you know, what's yeah, you're so weird? used to seeing it and you don't see it and it yeah. feels weird. Yeah, it yeah. feels weird. So so I don't know. It's just two months. Okay, I know I know before that people, they have released it and uh, people have been trying out and so on, right? Uh, but production wise or release wise, it's uh, just just two months. Uh, I don't know where this is going to be honest, and I don't know whether anyone was like suddenly be shouting in some forums like, what the hell is happening? Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I'm just showing you what I what I discovered. Okay, cool. Thanks. I'll definitely try it on my own. Yeah, you should try it. You should try it. And uh, and if you see any difference, uh, do do flag it out. <laughs> let, let everybody know whether there's something. Yeah. All right. Maybe one last question. Anyone? It's not a question specific to you, but is anybody here using generics in production yet? And what is the use case for it, like the practical use case people are doing? Hmm. No, it's not yeah, in production It doesn't yet. seem like it. Oh, <laughs> no. I, I don't know. If you watch the previous presentation, there were generics in the tests. Uh, and in my company, we also use generics when we don't want to write uh, like equal, uh, I don't know, just write one function which compare whatever types supplied. Hmm. Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I think it's actually very useful. Um, but if you have really written all the code, right, and you're unlikely to go back and refactor every single thing just to make it generic. You're probably going to say, okay, when I need to change it, then I will change it to, to the new paradigm. That's, that's what I feel. Yeah. <clears throat> oh, sorry. Uh, probably what can I think about it is uh, maybe if you just write like business logic code, right? Probably you won't need it. But maybe if you write library code, maybe, maybe as simple as um, minimum of integer and integer because we have integer, integer 64, in 32. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's a pain uh, to write. Yeah, of this. yeah, yeah, probably that's what I think. Yeah, yeah. You, you should look at the uh, constraints package. It's quite interesting. Basically, basically say uh, they have signed and unsigned um, constraints. Uh, and basically, it's all the collection of int, int 8, int 16, int 32, int 64, right? And then they have unsigned, which is u int, u int, like so it's, it's all basically that. And then you have uh, a number, and then the number is basically a union of uh, sign and you sign. So, yeah, it's it's quite interesting. 
Okay, thank you for the questions and responses. Uh, it's been a very thank good you. talk. And uh, thank you, Sao Xiong, and thank you, Bok Woon. And uh, this is the last of this evening. And before we go, uh, I'd like to invite every one of you to go to the center. Let's take a group photo. Uh, I think it's, it's, uh, it's, it's worthwhile celebrating this uh, coming together again physically. And, and yeah, please.